Hi guys, today we start a new series called The Theory of Strength Training. In these 10 episodes, we're going to discuss all the most important factors that have to be taken into account while designing an effective training program. But before we dive into it, and some of you might start wondering what does any of this have to do with anything, let's first talk a little bit about why should anyone bother learning this material. Is strength training really that complicated? I guess we could say not really, but at the same time that could be said about a lot of things, like driving for example. Is driving really a rocket science? Well, most of us are not astronauts and yet most of us know how to drive. But can you imagine that people decided to learn how to drive all on their own without having someone to explain to them traffic regulations and how the car operates? I guess we could agree that that wouldn't be such a good idea. And yet that's what most of us do when it comes to training. People just show up at the gym and start making stuff up. And the problem is not so much that for the most part they're just wasting their time. The real issue is that most people don't understand how dangerous some of the things they do at the gym could be, which is especially evident to me being a physical therapist. It seems that almost every time I walk into the gym, I see someone doing something crazy. And I should restrain from saying anything because we all know that that wouldn't be received very well. The guys would probably get very defensive and the girls would for sure assume that I'm trying to sleep with them. And my point is that yes, the strength training is really not that complicated. But the time you spend at the gym would be much more productive if you understood a few basic concepts. And I should say productive and fun because even if you could hire the most expensive coach in the world to babysit you at the gym, I just can't help wondering how fun would that kind of training be. Just imagine that I took a set of chess and without explaining the rules of the game just told you to move different pieces in random directions. One more! Come on! Well, it's the same thing if I just took you to the gym and told you to do this and that. And then you were supposed to do it three times a week. How long do you think that would last? Few weeks at most, because if you don't understand the reason behind any of it, it's pretty stupid. And there goes your New Year's resolution. And I'm not trying to say that everyone at the gym has to know the theory of strength training. It's a free country, you can do whatever you want. But if you're one of those few that just must push their bodies to an absolute limit, I invite you to stick around. Because if you were ever to achieve any significant results at the gym, you really need to know what you're doing. And that's what this series is going to be all about. And we're going to start our discussion by talking about adaptation. Without getting overly scientific, we're just going to say that adaptation is the ability of our body to adapt to the demands placed on it. The sun tanning is the easiest way to illustrate how adaptation works. If you spend long enough time in the sun, your skin color will darken a little bit in order to protect itself in case of a future exposure. Well, believe it or not, you getting bigger and stronger at the gym is nothing else than your body's attempt to adapt to the fact that you have too much free time on your hands and lifting all those heavy weights. Sun tanning is a pretty straightforward analogy, but we can still deduct two very important principles of how adaptation works from it. Number one is causality, meaning cause and effect relationship. Adaptation is not random. Our muscles don't get bigger from laying on the beach and our skin doesn't get darker from lifting weights. Specific stimulus produces specific response. And this is a very important concept to understand and we will be revisiting this in more detail in one of the future episodes. But for now, let's just remember that in order for us to evoke a particular adaptation, the most appropriate stimulus must be selected. And you might have heard term directed adaptation. What that means is that since we know how our body will react to a particular training variable, we can then manipulate those training variables in order to guide adaptation in the desired direction. And that's why you don't do yoga to grow muscles and you don't do powerlifting to get ready for marathon. The second principle is optimum dose. Everyone knows that spending one minute in the sun is not enough to get a nice tan. On the other hand, if I went sunbathing for a few hours right away, I'll probably get a sunburn, meaning 
that in order for us to produce a desired adaptation, the stimulus must fall within a specific range. And the same thing applies to training. If I was to drop down here and do 20 push-ups, not much would probably happen. On the other hand, if I went to the gym and tried to squat with 1,000 pounds on my back, I would probably end up in a wheelchair. What optimum dose of training is for you will depend on your training status. For someone who has never exercised before, even doing 20 push-ups might be too much. On the other hand, there are actually people who are capable of squatting with 1,000 pounds. In fact, when I was a bouncer, the guy that used to work with me at the door could do much more than that. And the takeaway message here is that what you should be doing in the gym has very little to do with what current Mr. Olympia does at the gym and has everything to do with what optimum dose of training is for you depending on your training status. And we will continue this discussion in the following episode and I promise you that the things will get a little more complicated. So let's just consider this episode as a warm-up. But for now that's going to be it and I'll see you guys next time.